Good evening and welcome to this, the fifth uh, Flop26 live stream. Many thanks for watching and many thanks to the supporters of this project. I'm immensely grateful to you all for enabling this project, uh, the point of which is to show the world that the Festival of Doom and Hypocrisy in Glasgow uh, does not enjoy the last word or the support of the entire country. If you're watching and you're enjoying the series, please help if you uh, if you can, either by donating or by, by subscribing uh, to the channel, uh, liking the content, which helps too. And most importantly, please share these conversations uh, so that more people can see them. That's the, the whole point. And on that point, in 1997, Channel 4 showed a series of films that seemed to suggest that global warming wasn't the catastrophe that scientists said was looming over us. Scare stories, said the films, have wildly exaggerated scientific evidence and the radical solutions being proposed to save the world might not be in our interests and may even harm the chances of people living in developed countries of ever reaching decent standards of living. A young man, not much older than Greta is today, was outraged and he was determined to fight the evil arguments that the broadcaster had had the audacity to transmit. And so he began his campaign by arguing with the spectre that now surely haunted the world and that now threatened to lead us all into the abyss. He gathered the facts, he read the books and he watched the films. And then he changed his mind. That young man, of course, was me. The point that that is the power and the point of films, books, and debate of careful, rational argument in an open, free, democratic society. And that's why some people want to close it down. That series of films was called Against Nature. And, and that is why I am personally delighted um, to introduce our guest tonight, uh, the man who made them, Martin Durkin. Good evening, Martin. Good evening. Um, I didn't know that story, Ben. That's so nice. I'm so <laughs> pleased. I've so many times thought that, uh, thank you for having me, uh, that you are the most, um, you, you understand this issue better than anyone else. And I'm always tempted. I, I can't just retweet and like absolutely everything that Ben Pyle does on Twitter, although it is enormously tempting to do so. But now I understand why your grasp of this issue is so perfect. It's because you were initially sparked by that series. Well, I was going to say, Martin, this is all your fault, isn't it? <laughs> what have you got to say for yourself? You know who to blame, viewers. Um, so I'll just quickly point out to people who don't know, if I can... Yeah, Martin is the man, apart from Against Nature, which was the 90s film I referred to. He's also the man behind the equally provocative film in 2007, The Great Global Warming Swindle, which we're going to talk about in a moment. And in 2016, his crowdfunded film, Brexit the Movie, helped set the case for the winning side. More recently, he has made The Great American Race Game and Guns and Freedom the Movie. Um, so yeah, do you want to do you want to just briefly talk us through, not not the uh, the, the the two recent ones, um, race game and guns and freedom, if you want to, or or any other of your latest projects? Um, yeah, well, the the race game one was just inspired by this uh, the, uh, um, uh, BLM and all the new kind of um, uh, um, the leftist embrace of anti-racism, which seemed to me the exact opposite they seem to be sort of uh, it seemed to be a cynical ploy by the left in order to make their cause a bit more noble and it seems so, so full of bs that it had to be um uh, confronted so i did it in a great american race game which anyone who despises blm and all the wokeness will really love it um, um i hope and uh, guns and freedom again was was just uh, there were so many people who hate guns and so what is it with the Americans and guns? So I wanted to make a film that said, you know what, they are absolutely sensible and right in their intuitive understanding that they should hang on to those guns and not allow this, the state a monopoly of armed force. 
but obviously that's a hard thing to argue. So I, I thought I'd set out and make a, a, a feature length doc on it. So it goes into the history and all that sort of thing. And I hope there's a, I, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a lot of gags along the way. And so it, uh, it's a, it's a jolly watch. It's a, it's a story of um, how people are liberated, isn't it? It's quite a... Yeah, no, it's a big, big historic story of, of why people are free and when they're not, why they're not. Um, you know, right back to the Greeks, Aristotle and Plato both could see in different Greek cities, whenever the people are armed, there is democracy. And when, whenever they're not, um, you know, they're tyrannised over. Um, and the same happens in Rome. The same happens throughout the European Middle Ages, where you know the serfs are denied arms, and when they can get arms, you know they rebel. And um, that was the whole, you know, the, the question of popular ownership of arms was behind the English Civil War and the English Bill of Rights and so on and so forth. And you know the the fact that communist and fascist regimes are so you know keen to disarm those that they're uh, um, um, are planning to mass murder. Um, uh, we go to we we go into in the film, and it's uh, I'm, I'm I'm pleased to say that um, many people who have seen it who started off very anti-gun ended up being very pro-gun at the end. It speaks to that sort of conceit that exists on the on on the other side, I suppose uh, that that power can be nice. That yeah, and that the nice. state can be trusted, and that they can be trusted, and that we cannot be trusted. Um, mm. And uh, we, I mean, I go into the arguments about murder rates in America and all that sort of thing. We don't we don't dodge any of their accusations. Uh, but you know, essentially, um, in America, it is an argument between the deplorables and the you know, Hillary Clinton blob elite, um, the the intelligentsia who hates guns. But it was rather keen on sort of apologizing, you know, um, uh, 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 romanticizing communism. Um, but uh, and, and 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 the ordinary Americans who quite rightly um, uh, have an intuitive mistrust of state which you know is historical and deeply rational right so um you may have noticed um but there's something going on in uh, glasgow um, oh yeah do you, do you what what do you are you watching it uh, do you do you think anything's going to come of it do you are you bothered I mean, um i i think that uh, well a little bit will come from it. I hope that it's a gigantic flop. Um, um, but um, it, the thing is, for them, I don't think it's necessary for something to come of it or not, because it's, you know, they just lie about, you know, what they want to achieve. They essentially, they want these huge conferences to go on. They want vast amounts of money um, um, diverted into their organizations and their research projects and their renewable industries. And so long as that bandwagon carries on, they're fine. They don't give a damn about CO2. They clearly don't give a damn about CO2. You know, they drive, they, they fly about in helicopters and all of this mm. sort of thing. You know, if you think it's about CO2, you know, you're very much mistaken. It's about power. So um, <clears throat> I've got a few other items from the news. Uh, uh, it's not, not Boris Johnson has uh, flown back from COP apparently on a on a private jet. Um, so from from a, a festival of hypocrisy to uh, a pretty bog standard sleaze fest, um, I, yeah. I would suggest. I mean, the, the hypocrisy is nauseating. I mean, the, the and, and and very telling. You know, there he is. He's on holiday with uh, Zach Gold in Zach Goldsmith's luxury villa. I mean, Zach Goldsmith, he's banging the drum. Going, What's he doing with the luxury villa? But he clearly flies through the whole time. I mean, clearly he doesn't believe this nonsense. Um, or if he does, the but I think I mean you you mentioned before that we've got to get beyond just calling them hypocrites because the thing is even if Boris Johnson lived in a wooden shack and you know walked everywhere and never took a car in his life, it still doesn't make it true that CO two is driving um, our climate and we're all about to face a catastrophe and we should all pay more taxes and be more regulated, you know. So even if the hypocrisy weren't there, it doesn't you know stop it just being all I think long. I think I think it's I mean with with Zach and Boza it's uh it's more of a question of I mean it's just it's just grubby isn't it he the, the, the Zach Goldsmith stood on this sort of platform at one point of saying uh, 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 constituents should have the right to recall MPs um, and then he lost his seat. He, he lost several several attempts, and then lost his seat. And then within five minutes, is made a, a peer, 
and then and then given a, a position on on at the government. That's 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 just. Boris Johnson's mm -hmm. brother has been made a peer. I mean, it's all entirely right. grubby. The whole, the whole of the House of Lords obviously is grubby. But, you know, the, it's an entire grubby political class for the most part, with some honourable exceptions like Steve Baker and others. But um, mm. yeah, it's entirely grubby. It's grubby that these old Etonians are um, pontificating about, uh, you know, the, the virtue of policies which will have the effect of impoverishing ordinary people in Britain and um, uh, keeping in poverty ordinary people in, develop, in the developing world. We'll, we'll come back to those points, but um, so here's, a, here's another one. Um, this is, uh, again, again, it's not COP, but uh, it's sort of speaking to the so what's sort of developing there, which is a very weird view of media. Um, uh, Facebook fails to flag denial, say some pearl-clutching weirdos as far as i can tell I can tell the um the the main the main point of which they're saying is that uh 7, posts describing climate change as hysteria alarms them a scam or other related terms uh, uh only eight percent of which were marked as misinformation so someone's not doing their job some censor isn't isn't properly doing the job it's, uh, no it is it is the degree of of, of censorship soft censorship hard censorship is absolutely staggering and this is actually part of the story of the consensus this is how they keep the consensus by absolutely shutting up um anything and shutting out anything that could possibly disagree uh, with their um uh, you know with the dogma yeah spot on um similarly or very very weird story um revealed by laura dodsworth today the news is being nudged um, Sky announced that it was collaborating with the Independent Behavioural Insights team, the Nudge Unit, uh, the, um, uh, and, and they're, they're sort of uh, putting plot lines into, into uh, soaps and, uh, or, and putting framing news agendas and, and all sorts of all sorts of stuff. Yeah, that's been going um, on for years. I know, so. Do you think it's stepped up? I was going to, because this is what some people are saying. Some people say there's always been a weird relationship between the news media and the the uh, uh, and the government. But but is there? A, you, you can sort of see the point of that. The Cold War. Yeah, no, like I can't. I mean, I can't talk about it too much because I still work in um, uh, 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 right. the industry and I'm sort of bound by, you know. Uh, but but um, uh, uh, next year I will be able to spill the beans fully on the degree to which broadcasters insist on this, you know, being the line and the degree to which they will uh, shut out, um, a, you know, anyone who uh, disagrees. Is this parallel to what happens to scientists when they rock the boat by saying that this nonsense isn't true? So join the Flop26 live stream on the 1st of January, everyone, please. Because uh, <laughs> we want to hear more. Uh, let's see if there's uh, another story. Uh, uh, yeah, similar, but uh, BBC and all and other broadcasters here are committing to the climate content pledge at COP26, um, and this is again to it's the same story, really, isn't it? Yeah, there's um, no editorial objectivity whatsoever. This is a you know a universal acceptance of a particular um, highly political, highly dubious theory, and it's it is it, it's conquered mainstream media i mean entirely right they, they've i mean they, they, that that seems to be the, the the alignment of 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 organizations and institutions seems to have been the you, you, the more the agenda than getting the public on board isn't it that that, that that's yeah that no there's no um you know there just can't be any chink of light you know um through this through this wall there cannot be even the faintest hint of opposition that's the real nature of the consensus it's a it's a terror it's absolutely terrifying i mean if someone had told me that this would be the case you know in a, in a modern industrial uh, um, country that imagines itself to be free um you know um i thank god for social media uh, you know because mm. otherwise th this would, would be just a blanket refusal to allow anyone to and it is with I mean, you can see it in, in politics the greens have managed to elect get one MP elected, you know, in Brighton, a bit odd in Brighton, and yet the green agenda is absolutely dominates the, you know, has conquered the policy of all political parties. Who do you vote for if you if you don't agree with this nonsense? You forget it, you know. Mm. I, I'm in Hackney. Who do you vote for if you if you think it's all nonsense? 
everyone agrees, the political class, the, the media, um, uh, everything, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an enormous stitch up. And I don't think you can fully understand the power of w what they have on their side and, and this consensus, which actually is just, you know, another word for saying that the blob is united on this. Um, it's, 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 you know, oligarchical, bugger democracy. So in a different era-ish, um, things did seem to be a bit different, right? Um, so here's the intro. I'm going to watch a few seconds of your the intro to the Great Global Warming sc uh, Swindle, um, if that's all right. Mm. Imagine that we live in an age of reason. And the global warming alarm is dressed up as science, but it's not science, it's propaganda. There's no direct evidence which links 20th century global warming to uh, anthropogenic greenhouse gases. We're just being told lies, that's what it comes down to. You can't say that CO2 will drive climate. It certainly never did in the past. If the CO2 increases in the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas, then the temperature will go up. But the ice core record shows exactly the opposite. So the fundamental assumption of the whole theory of climate change due to humans is, is shown to be wrong. Man-made global warming Oops. is no longer just a theory about climate. It is one of the defining moral and political causes of our age. Campaigners say the time for debate is over. Any criticism, no matter how scientifically rigorous, is illegitimate. Even worse, dangerous. Brilliant stuff. Um, yeah, do you want to uh, go over the, the, the story, uh, the, 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 the argument? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we go into the argument about um, uh, uh, CO2-led warming, we, and we say that, you know, although CO2 is a greenhouse gas, you know, it's one that's... You know, got a, 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 you know limited power, um, and the evidence suggests that it is not driving climate, and has never driven climate in, in the past. And uh, it doesn't make sense that it should have done um, now for all sorts of reasons. You know, we've just had the Holocene period where for thousands of years temperatures have been going down while CO two has been going up. Blah 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 goes into that, and it looks into the 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 evidence about. Um, solar activity and the clouds being a much, you know, that is really what's uh, driven climate in the past. It's, it's, it's quite obvious now, and it's becoming increasingly obvious since this film was made. Um, and yet, you know, the IPCC, I think in this latest report, is saying that the influence of the sun on climate is zero. Zero. So um, we go into the science and then we go, uh, I unpacked a little bit about the politics of, you know, what's behind this, you know, what's politically behind this, because it does, you know, if, 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 you know, what explains their enthusiasm for the climate crisis? Um, but actually, I wish I'd, um, you know, uh, I'm tempted to make the film again uh, next year. I would like to make the film again next year because uh, I've sort of this was a this film was made in a in a, in a hurry at the request of a, a rather wonderful um, a commissioning editor, Channel Four, Hamish Makura. Um, but um, now that I've sort of having made it and having sort of lived with this story for another decade, I think you know. I've, I had to think so much more about the nature of this consensus because why if the if the science doesn't stack up won't this damn thing fall down that's the big question and also as you know when you're arguing with you know an ordinary joe about this and you say oh no 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 it's all bollocks about co2 changing the climate they say oh yeah of course it is um and they cite the consensus so in a sense it's it's a we've got a twin job on our hands one to um, show that the science is duff, which I think is the easier of the jobs, um, and the other to explain what the nature of this beast consensus is. Uh, zero to heroes thing. Uh, see, Channel Four would never do it now, um, which is certainly well, true. We'll see. I'll pitch them in the next couple of months. Let's see. <laughs> so I, um, if, I, let's, this? if I can get the next screen up, there we go. I thought at the time um, or, or since. You, you'd stuck your neck out really, really quite far. Uh, but 
Sven, uh, Svensmark, um, is that right? Svensmark, yeah, yeah Henrik Svensmark and Nir Shaviv, um persisted. And I, I think they got the same kind of um, hassle you did, and we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, but they're getting recognition for their work and, and their publishing. And they've, been, they've been at it the whole time. Um, and and they're getting getting results for for their uh, hypotheses. But what what I think that really speaks to is the fact that uh, people who tried to close down your films and and shut down their research and smearing you all uh, uh, through and, and through lobbying behind the scenes, they were simply wrong, right? Uh, where, whether or not it's the whole story, you know, um, it, I don't know whether it's the final chapter of climate change science. It, you know, made well, what proportion? Um, the, 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 the it's not at all, and they, and they don't claim that it is. But they, at least no. they're saying, look, guys, we're looking entirely in the wrong direction. This is where obviously something's happening, and all the evidence suggests that something's happening here. It doesn't mean that we fully understand the results of solar activity, or you know, the orbital position of the Earth, or the. Uh, influence of cosmic ray flux and the formation of clouds, but it's clearly there. Are, there is so much there that makes it obvious that whatever's going on is in the, that direction. And CO two, forget it, forget it. It's a trace gas in the atmosphere. Does bugger all. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm going to still trying to navigate the screen. I think that's one. There we go. I'll get used to it one day. This is, um, I mean, I, re I, re I referred earlier to my history, how it all kicked off for me. And uh, I, I was moving to the point at which I was going to change my mind. But if there is a decisive moment in, in the history of me <laughs> that I, I did completely switch sides, um, this was it. Okay, this is in, uh, I think, 2002 uh, in Oxford. Um this may be familiar to some people. Oops, we're going to have to put up with an advert. Sorry. Really hard to read. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I get that. That's annoying. Time, but I actually. Bloody YouTube. Yeah, it's still better than Mark Linus. Yeah. So that was um, environmental activist Mark Linus throwing a custard pie into the face of Bjorn Longborg, saying, "That's uh, for everything you say about the climate, which is bullshit, or, or, or something like that." Um, the sound was a bit low, so I don't know if everyone could hear that. Um, and uh, that was a guy, Bjorn Longborg, with a very detailed, very convincing, carefully argued book. Um, being debunked by a custard pie, pie uh, by Mark Linus, who was rewarded for his pie throwing uh, by being given a nice job at o Oxford University, um, that being the job spec um, for or academic jobs in the 21st century, I think. I'm um, going we'll to go now to uh, another clip, another, here's... Uh, Mark Linus, a few years later, uh, suggesting that there should be future juries like the Nuremberg trials, um, because people who might want to challenge climate science or climate politics are in the same moral category as Holocaust deniers. Um, it is rather ironic given the Nazi origins of environmentalism. <laughs> I've written a very, very big uh, uh, essay outlining how uh, it emerged from the, the Vocus movement that created the uh, uh, the National Socialists. I mean, the National Socialists pretty much invented environmentalism. And, uh, you know, it's no accident that immediately after the war, the biggest um, environmentalist party emerged in Germany. Um, but that's another story. They're not, they're not very flexible intellectually, are they? Um, if I can get another... Uh, yes, yeah, story. Yeah. I, I think these people. These. So this is um, this is an insulate Britain uh, protest today, which is being reported, um, and they've managed to block the the path to an insulation uh, a lorry with insulation on it, which I mean just speaks to their their, their ability uh, 
to think. Um, I mean, I'm so I'm astonished at the restraint of tradesmen, lorry drivers, so many others, you know, reps trying to get to well, these guys. <laughs> oh, well, this is a bit more like it. You know, I mean, <laughs> it, Good it, for them. So, so Good if anyone them. doesn't know, I mean, I, I can't believe that there's anyone in, who's watching us now who doesn't know exactly what that oh. is. But um, that's the Battle of Canning Town. Um, when, when I think is probably the the closest thing there's been to an opinion poll on on XR, which with any real significance, I I, I think that shows um, that that shows what people think. Uh, yeah, no, but, especially but, especially the sort of ordinary working class and commercial middle class people who are on their way to you know trying to earn a living and doing all that, they can't bear all this green stuff. I mean, they just they can't bear the middle class. Excuse my French wankers, uh, you know, sort of behind it. Um, and this is true in terms of TV as well. Whenever they put anything green on TV, the ratings do that. Greta Thunberg, that. You know, someone twiddling on about that. I mean, they'll tune into the um, uh, uh, BBC Nature stuff because they want to see fish and they want to see monkeys. But, you know, they don't tune in because Attenborough is wittering on about us being you know, overpopulated and all that sort of thing. Whenever there's green programming, ordinary people do not want to watch it. Mm, and, yeah, you know, right. Who do they want to watch? They want to watch Top Gear. They want to watch Jeremy Clarkson. It's, here's, a, here's another XR. Uh, sorry, it's in Insulate Britain. He's from, from the same... The the the, the 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 where they where the, the picture I just showed a moment ago. So he's gonna he's got something to say. I'm not sure how wonderful it's gonna be, but let's he's leaning against just, the truck or he's glued himself to it. He's he's glued himself to the to the police van. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll play. Uh, I, he, he does get asked. Um, I'll, I'll play it. Um, Can we jump off the carrier, please? Uh, unfortunately, I am stuck to. So you've glued yourself to yeah, the police I have van. Been, yeah. Okay. So you've off. glued yourself to the police van. He's glued himself to your van. So that would delay all these other people leaving, that's fine. Um, she just drive off. Why wonderful, would you like that? wonderful advert for whoever made the glue. Sorry? A wonderful advert for whoever made the glue. It's just from me at these clips. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, so I don't I don't think he's got anything very interesting. He goes on, he goes on um to say. Uh, each year, that's 100 a day in winter, dying of fuel poverty. That's the government's own data. Um, we have a situation here where we've got some of the leakiest homes in Europe, and we know we've got to reduce our CO2 emissions. 15% of this country's CO2 emissions um, come from our, our uninsulated houses. Italy is paying people 10% on top of the cost up to 100,000 euros. Oh well, he just he just rattles off some right, uh, later on. Quality, so let's have cheaper fuel. I mean, let's have cheaper energy. What the is he talking well, about? Well, he was going to. He goes on to say. I think he goes on to say about all the all the doom, all the people that are going to die, and uh, uh, in oh, really? um, twenty meters of sea level rise by oh, tomorrow. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so, but what? But I mean, so you, you're right. You're right when you say most people don't don't uh, don't give a stuff. But but there is a sense in which some people do. So I'm, I I I think what he's a victim of is that there's no there's no there's no debate allowed, and so that in either creates this extremist view in him, or or he feels licensed to go and be he's, an arsehole. I asshole, don't think he's a victim of this stuff at all. I think he's a perpetrator of this nonsense. I mean, look at his haircut. You know, he's a middle <laughs> class anti capitalist. I mean, these people are. This is this is absolutely mother's milk to them. This right. Is, so it like, so it like, but so, but so I say if if Martin Durkin was given a, 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 a an hour a week show. Then, the, uh, then society may not license these weirdos in quite the same way. So, so I'm, I'm suggesting. I'm not. I'm not. I, I, it's not. It's not a concrete uh, hypothesis. For that. I think. I think that the, the trouble is the people who really sort of buy this stuff are not going to be persuaded um, um, out of it. I mean, I no, think but it's licensed. Middle class greens, you know, they, they they loathe the idea that there is science stacked up against this. I mean, they yeah. they 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 cling on to this theory. They love it. They're not scared that the world's coming to an end. They love, you know, the implications of this doom mongering that they've got because you right. know, they're, they're effectively arguing for higher taxes and more regulation and more state control. And for the most part, these are people who are either directly employed by the state or, uh, you know, connected with organisations that are indirectly uh, connected with the state or just subjectively, you know, dis despise 
free markets. And so they, you know, for, in large measure, they do not hate high taxes because the taxes go to them and they don't um, fear greater regulation because they are the regulators. And, you know, they don't fear more state control because they are the state or are connected right. to it. So so the, I can imagine this guy being one of the guys that wrote one of the several hundred letters to Ofcom trying to get your um, great global warming swindle um, or get you punished for it in some way. Um, which, is that right? Can you, can you, can you talk about them? Uh, yeah, there was a big, um, uh, uh, an awful lot of letters written to uh, Ofcom demanding that, you know, my head and all that sort of thing. Um, and the difficulty is when you have a regulator like Ofcom, they don't want, they, they, they don't want to be portrayed as toothless and also, they're run by people who are, for the most part, middle class leftists who are quite sympathetic to all this. So um, and when you have an awful lot of people write to them complaining, they feel like they've got to slap you on the wrist a bit. And so there is the problem is, I mean, oddly enough, they didn't very much for me. They found against I, I, there were, I mean, one complaint was 200 pages long, but they were, I've got a file that big with complaints to Ofcom. They found me against me for one thing, which is misleading one of the contributors. Um, and into being in the program, which I didn't, but anyway, tralala. Um, but they feel the trouble is broadcasters, if they even if they didn't have these sort of leftist pro, you know, climate prejudices anyway, they fear censure from organizations like Ofcom. That's a big deal if you're a broadcaster. And Ofcom right. wants to be seen to be doing stuff. And so there is this indirect way in which you know, that's how soft censorship works in the media. But I think, as you say, it's actually changed because it's got much harder. Now they're just flagrant about it. You know, they they are on the side of the warmest and they are shutting out critical voices. Well, so this is what I'm saying. So it starts off, it started off very much as a, as a, as, as sort of a, a couple of activist organizations getting, getting their members or you know, their activist members, not necessarily their, you know, uh, five quid a month members but they're, they're at this uh to 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 ev everyone's got to write into channel four or offcom and 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 say how terrible this is but but now it's sort of a that kind of um challenge like we were talking about with all the 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 alignment of the the, the broadcasters um but but it, it, around the same time there was much more um institutions were weighing in a lot more weren't they that there was a not a, 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 a uh, you know, institutional science and and and, and other organisations sort of put their oar in, um, and they were run by people who you know um, um, are, are very much of the same class and of the very very much the same view on uh, climate as in uh, and also Brexit and you know they're, 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 so on and so forth. They all are in a sense a part of either the state or certainly they're part of the intelligentsia in, in terms of people who are working in the media. And so, you know, it's not that they've been captured by this thing. They are generating this thing. I mean, they embrace it. You know, people, you know, in, in, in broadcasters, they, you know, if you go in and say, I'd like to do a bit that defends Trump and says he's, maybe he's not so bad after all, you know, they will despise you. You know, they are, there is, you know, a social class. I know we've talked about this before, but, you know, a, a social class here that is very united in its view of the world. Um, and that's what that's finding expression, uh, and they run the mainstream media. Mm. So what, when I uh, uh, yeah right so so I, I I remember sort of seeing some of those criticisms certainly from some scientists uh, I, I forget the names of the film, and um, and 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 I, I thought they would they haven't really addressed. Even as a layperson, I could see they haven't addressed the scientific argument. They were sort of, well, we've looked at the sun and and we've decided that there, there's no, there's no, there's nothing to look, there's nothing, there's nothing there. No, that 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 was. Uh, no, they couldn't uh, get. They couldn't, very, get they couldn't get us on the science, and that's yeah. sort of. And, 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 and then and then um, it's just sort of like a bit more of a survey of looking at sort of uh, uh, scientists' interventions, especially from sort of you know the, the panjandrums, the Royal Society or or the IPCC. Um, there wasn't much difference between a bog standard green ink letter and a letter from uh, from a scientific institution or a, you know a, 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 or someone claiming to to write for a scientific institution. 
Oh, um, yeah, the, no, the, the argument doesn't get any better as you go up this intellig intelligentsia. This, it's, it's sort of like a, it's a sort of marked by an absence of intelligence in a, in a, in a, in a no, sense. No, and it is quite extraordinary, actually, the ignorance of um, scientists. There aren't very many scientists who really know about the kind of science in this area. All this thing about, look at all these scientists who agree. All these scientists don't know anything about meteorology. <laughs> you know? I mean, if you ask a scientist who actually has been studying the breeding habits of squirrels, all your things about climate change, you know, I, it, you might as well, he's as qualified as your average cab driver to tell you about um, a climate science. And in fact, I think you're probably better off talking to a, your average cab driver who's probably got a gazoodle's more sense. But um, they, haven't, they haven't got a clue. And obviously, and even the, the supposed um, uh, scientists, the climate scientists who do have a, 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 a clue, they're people like Michael Mann, you know, all of these people who have been, you know, named and shamed for their work and so on and so forth. I mean, you've talked well, about that already. He, well, he's, he's that sort of celebrated celebrated climate scientist. He's just a bit of a, I mean, not quite a Walter Mitty, but he's sort of portrays himself as a victim of all us nasty people. But it's a sort of closing of ranks, isn't it? It's more than, more, more than they're intelligent. They sort of there's an a the the this intelligentsia is able to close ranks, but you've you've called it the new class. So do you want to do you want to set out what your what your theory of the new class is? Um, I... Yeah, well, if, if I could lead up to it a bit, actually, because I was thinking about you know what 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 is it that sort of is behind this consensus, um, and there's a, there's a, there's a, a few things. First of all, actually, it's a, it. it Consensus is too nice a word for it. It's used to bully and intimidate scientists who um, have the temerity to say anything that doesn't sort of fit into the um, uh, 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 the dogma. And so, you know, scientists are maligned, um, threatened with a sack, denied funding, denied publication, and so on. So, so the consensus really is a kind of thuggery. It's an anti-science thuggery more than a consensus. Um, and behind it, uh, the first thing obviously is money because there are there are tens of billions i mean some of the estimates are hundreds of billions of dollars um involved in this industry every year i mean obviously there's the, the the renewables industry which is absolutely gigantic but also enormous amount of money going into funding of science um, uh, research uh, institutes universities ngos so on and so forth i mean so there's an enormous amount riding on this um, which and, and that means jobs and you know the, the, the careers of lots lots of people and they and, and that it's all dependent on CO two being sort of the demon. So they take very personally anyone who says that that's not true because all of this edifice kind of collapses and there's not only the careers, their funding and so on, there are also their reputations. These people have been grinding on about this, you know, for you know decades now. They simply can't say, oh, do you know what? I think you know you're you're, you're right. Maybe CO two is not. You, that's just not going to happen. That can't happen. That can't be allowed to happen. So all of that's going on. But there's as well as that. There's also ideology. Um, and so you know, if you go into um, I live in Hackney, and if you go to a nice middle class drinks party in Hackney and say you think it's all nonsense, it's not that they say, oh well, I'm not sure scientifically if that's true, or even that actually. But a lot of these scientists agree. They think you're wicked. They think it's a, it's they, they 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 equate skepticism of CO two led climate change um, to liking Nigel Farage and liking Donald Trump and voting Brexit um, and liking supermarkets and you know being pro individual freedom uh, and so on and so forth. So it's a kind of it, it's 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 a it's, it's a proxy for middle class anti capitalism, um, and if you disagree with them. There's that. So I, uh, that ideological thing um, interested me uh, uh, from the start. I remember when I was making actually um, Global Warming Swindle, going to a, an anti-capitalist rally in um, Blackheath, wrecking it. And I was thinking, who are these people here? Because the thing is, you know, in the old days, when I was a dirty Marxist, you, you thought anti-capitalism, that's supposed to be the workers. But if there was one group of people who were not there, it was the workers. You know, there were no stevedores or shipyard workers or lorry drivers or anything like that. Girls from Boots worked on the tills. They weren't there. The working lantern-jawed proletarians were singularly absent. 
Um, so I thought, well, the, the, these people are middle class, but they're not all of the middle class. They're not the commercial middle class. Mm -hmm. They're not estate agents and secondhand car dealers and insurance salesmen and under managers at United Biscuits and things like that. They weren't there. This was another branch of the middle class that didn't have a name. I mean, we sort of try and give it a name. You know, the, the Europeans would roughly call it the intelligentsia. It's not a very satisfactory word. And also, we don't like the word intelligentsia because it suggests that there is a distinct group of people who will be paid to do our thinking for us, which offends us being sort of Anglo-Saxon and all that sort of thing. But mm. nevertheless, that was the group that was there. And, I, and they are a group that um, have... There's a mutual animosity between them and free markets. You know, they hold markets in disdain they would not want to have to sell something for a living or market something or be a sales rep or do you know be or be a an under manager at united biscuits or anything like that that's not what they do they want to uh, run things they want to teach things they want to analyze things they want to research things they want to govern they're part of the governing class um and also the market hates them because they have you know, the, the more intellectual they are, the less practical their degrees are. And so once they've got their, you know, MA in French literature, they find that, you know, no one wants to employ them. So they tend to go into the state. They tend to seek employment in the civil service or, you know, quasi-state institutions. So they become the state. So there's this huge line for the intelligence here in the state. And they want the state to grow. They want the state to be well-funded because they want to be well-funded. They want their arts projects to be well-funded and their scientific research to be well-funded when they're not working for ICI or someone. Um, and so they have, and this is, goes, goes, goes you know, back to the growth of this class in the Second World War. First and Second World War saw, saw the huge expansion of this class. And I, I reminded just before the podcast of words of Eisenhower when he said that there's a danger that public policy could itself become captive of a scientific technological elite because he was warning of what all this massive amount of public funding and power uh, going to this class during the Second World War, and it didn't shrink after the Second World War, what it would do to a free society. And sure enough, it's happened. Uh, they are the people who are the global warming class. They are the people for whom, actually, global warming is... It's, it's an excuse for more regulation. It's an excuse for more conferences. It's an excuse for more research. It's an excuse for more funny bunny jobs in you know, sustainability, diversity, office, blah, 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 all the things that they do. Um, so that's it was kind of that's what I've been thinking about. So there's a cult. So you're saying there's a sort of culturally received disdain for working in the market, uh, uh, and that that that's how you earn your living, right? So so people think, oh, private sector is a bit is a bit is a bit grubby. It's not it doesn't have a, the right kind of prestige to it. It doesn't have the entire, it, it, you have to work for your money. It's you don't grubby. get and it if by you go to university and you do um, a, a course in hotel management. Oh my God, they look down on that. You, right. know, if, you know, mechanical engineering is a bit if, but if it's philosophy or classics or French or English, then, you know, it's got the new class sort of status. You have right. more of the right. badge, of the new class. Galbraith has, has written about this. And so it's, it's, um, it's anti-capitalist, but it's a very snobby form of anti-capitalism. It's very different kind of old, the old red anti-capitalism, which but was supposed to be in favour of the working class and it was going to, uh, you know, there was going to be progress. We were going to make the working class richer because socialism would beat capitalism and, pro and we'd produce more and the working class yeah. would be richer under so Well, that obviously was bollocks and didn't work out. Um, but the, the, the green anti-capitalism is quite different. For them, it's the very success of capitalism which offends them. It's the fact that the oiks are getting so much money that there are these that are buying so many Nike shoes that are going on so many nice holidays. Um, this is the problem. It, when you when you read green literature, it's sort of climate literature, um, they always bang on about consumption. We're all consuming too much. But it's not their consumption that they're worried about. You know, they never mind about right. shops and, um, you know, Persian rug shops and vintners where they get all their posh wine. It's our consumption working class consumption that really offends them it's the ikeas and tescos and that sort of thing and likewise with travel you know when they go abroad it's travel it's 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 culturally blah 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 when mm. working class people go abroad it's mass tourism which is damaging to the environment yeah there is an incredible snobbery 
that runs through this, you know, disdain for consumption and all and, and hypocrisy to get back to the hypocrisy. But it's a very it's a posh anti-capitalism. It's a snobbish anti-capitalism yeah. that wants to restrain, contain ordinary other people. people. Yeah, right. Other people. It's always other people, isn't it? They, so uh, you, you mentioned some historical predictions that that of, of this, some some warning. Um, uh, uh, so what I was going to sort of what I was driving at was was thinking of was is this I mean it's well it's clearly that 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 uh, there's a, a sort of top down new front line on a on a class war essentially that they're sort of gradually asserting themselves more more forcefully um, but but it, it, environmentalism to the extent that it's part of that that battle has been going on. Uh, for quite a long time too. So not not I think was it was it Eisenhower you 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 were saying the what the warning was from. Did I miss yeah. did I miss you? Yeah. So uh, which which was uh, only probably predates the the sort of uh, early environmentalism and the neo Malthusians by a small historically only a small s s small amount. So do do you think it's always been conceived of as as a, I mean I, I'm going to call it a plan but uh was it always conceived of as that of a of a, a global bureaucracy that would have that effect um and and then how do we square if these are too many questions at once I'll I'll stop how do you square middle class anti-capitalism with the sort of mark carney strata of uber capital and it's it's reformulation around ESG. So you've got the, so there's sort of a, a yeah certainly a middle class. We can see that uh, sort of uh, differentiation by buying buying organic stuff and you know conspicuous yeah. recycling or whatever. But then Mark Carney and the ESG and that's all like uh, you know huge financial institutions with un, unprecedented levels of accumulated capital that they're trying to use to to uh to affect change i think rishi sunak yesterday i think announcing over 100 trillion pounds of rewiring or something i've, I've probably witted on too much so just if you can remember any of that then i'll do the last one then you have to remind me the one about the, the one before <laughs> right. i think that, yeah. um, i'm sorry there are different, a terrible host you're quite right there are different kind of constituencies different groups who are in this uh, who, who are sitting on the bandwagon as it were one is the kind of uh, the middle class intelligentsia in terms of in terms of numbers the new class they are the biggest um uh, in terms of number of people but in terms of importance too you've always had very big uh, capitalists big capital who have actually hated capitalism you know once you're at a particular size of company you hate competition you hate the little startups right. actually, and this is but lots of people have written about this crony capitalism you know, is one of the terms that's used in, in, in describing this. And they cozy up to the state because, you know, while they're of a certain size, they're cozy up to this other enormously wealthy, powerful institution that can do them good. Um, I remember filming at the um, European, um, uh, at the EU in Strasbourg and being shown this huge lobbying area where all the big companies line up. And the big companies were not for Brexit. Big companies were for Remain because they were, you know, they liked having the regulators forming regulations, which, you know, were in their interests, which helped to keep Japanese competition out, Chinese competition out, competition out from other states and all that sort of thing. So, you know, there, it, it, it's, it's, it's not true that big capital is pro-capitalist by any means. Little capital, that tends to be pro-capitalist because they're the, you know, the invaders. They're, 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 they're the ones who are keen on competition because they're the competitive ones. Big, fat, lazy capitalists aren't very competitive, and they're quite happy to cozy up. And, and you saw that, and you've seen that historically in the post-war period, you know, with the in Macmillan Tories and so on and so forth. The other group that's actually a rather sort of quirky one, but an interesting one, are the uh, actual TOFs, you know, the aristocrats. And the aristocrats, there's always been um, posh anti-capitalism among the aristocrats. And you can see it in the movement. There's, there's obviously uh, uh, Prince Charles, um, I was actually earlier making a little list of all the Etonians at the head of the uh, Green Movement. The Baron Lord Peter Melchett, remember him, Greenpeace, Jonathan Porritt, Zach Goldsmith, Edward Goldsmith. You have some people like Lady Eve Balfour, chair of the Soil Association. You know, there all these, you leap. And the Aristos have always traditionally held capitalism as, as, as vulgar, 
and, 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 and rather upsetting because the oik, it sort of elevated the oiks um, and it upset the hierarchy and it was a disruptor of social hierarchy. And so they were the ones who went on about the dark satanic mills um, and Duke of Wellington complaining about the railways because it meant, you know, the masses could just sort of travel into the countryside. And also, there's a, you know, they despised the nouveau riche trade. I've got a great quote, actually, from, um, uh, I think it's David Canadine on the decline of the British aristocracy. Patri the, pat the patrician sense of anger, he writes about the patrician sense of anger, disappointment, frustration and bewilderment that they were no longer lords of the earth and makers of history. Um, they regarded unbridled capitalism as dishonorable, corrupt and immoral. Um, you know, capitalism had unseated them, um, and 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 so they they they, they hated it, um, and they and they and they still hate it, and that's where the sort of their greenery comes from. I mean, Pop Charlie Boy, he's sort of fantasizing about a time when kings were kings. You know, kings used to have power, and you know, they they and now the only excuse for royalty is that they attract tourists. I mean, he's been you know degraded to a tourist attraction, so he's just bitter. <laughs> bitter. Um, and this finds expression in a yearning for healthier, you know, sort of times in the past where, you know, things were more authentic. And, you know, this is the kind of visceral thing that's behind his, obviously he doesn't understand the size at all. I mean, he could barely tie his shoelaces, but uh, that's what's behind that. So I think so you have these groups, you have the, you know, the, the big capital, um, you have the middle class anti-capitalists and around the edges, you have these toffs. So, so um, it, it, that's quite interesting. So, so, essentially, that sort of uh, the middle class, uh, sort of, it, it's almost an administrative class. It's quite happy, in some sense, to ignore some of the hypocrisy of what's above it, as long as it's conforming to. It's a clarity, isn't it? It's a yes. Yeah. It's it's a, it's a sort of a compact between the these sort of levels of a, a feudal system. Yeah, and they've, as always, long they've, as always, they've always been a bit aligned. You know, the medieval yeah. clerisy were, you know, were, were just, you know, servants of the toffs. And actually still today, if you, you know, you look at these supposedly left-wing um, 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 members of the kind of minor blob, they go all sort of weak at the knees whenever they see a, an aristocrat. Or they sort of, it's <laughs> pathetic. Yeah. Uh, so, um, look, so this, uh, for us... I mean, this is kind of abstract at the moment, isn't it? Like the, 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 w w but for some people in the world, um, the green, the green stuff is a lot more frightening. Um, and and I've got a clip here, so we'll just take a diversion from it, but bring it back to um, uh, uh, the new class in a moment. But um, this is a clip from Sky News this week about the. Uh, a looming famine in Madagascar. So we're going to play for about 30 seconds or so. Starkest image of how severely climate change is affecting Madagascar. And from our drone pictures, the snaking sand scar goes on and on and on. They dig because there is no water. This is all they have for drinking, washing, cooking, after the worst extended drought in 40 years. They're one of the lowest emitters of carbon emissions in the world and yet they are the country which is really feeling the most impact with the UN declaring that parts of the country are on the brink of tipping into famine. Climate change is killing and Malalaza is one of Madagascar's younger victims. She's barely got the strength to turn her head. She's the weight of a typical newborn. She's actually a year and two months old with few reserves to fight disease. She's now got tuberculosis, but is too weak to cry and protest very much. Yeah. She's living and slowly dying. Should we talk about this? The, um, in history. Yeah, sorry. I mean, the, um, the, 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 I mean, the hypocrisy when you, and this is the real hypocrisy, it's absolutely scandalous, when they use um, tragedies like this to um, uh, boost the, the, the climate argument. I mean, for a start, droughts have not increased in the past century, and it's very easy to look that up. Um, it's simply not true. And um, secondly, you know, when you have water management is the kind of solution to all, all tragedies like this or trading in food. Um, but on every front, the Greens conspire to keep poor people poor. Um, in, in the developing world, the main sort of hunger comes because 95 percent, roughly in parts of the developing world, as much as 95, 75 uh, percent of food 
goes to waste before it can ever reach the mouths of consumers. They've got the food, but it doesn't reach the mouths of the people who need it because it rots, because they have not got plastic packaging, because they have not got refrigerated lorries and other lorries and good roads, which are needed to get food to uh, consumers. Um, they, The Greens are against GM crops that would um, uh, be a solution to a lot of the problems of agriculture in the developing world. They're against um, the use of inorganic fertilizer. They're against the use of pesticides. I mean, there's a hell of a lot of pests nibbling at those plants in developing countries and rendering them useless. Um, they're against the, the use of herbicides. They're, you know, they are against what's um, needed to fight uh, hunger and poverty in the developing world. They also de they defend the common agricultural policy, which for decade upon decade upon decade has shut out African farmers uh, from selling to the biggest market on their doorstep, um, uh, 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 Europe, the richest market in the world. Um, they have contributed to poverty in the most appalling ways. Um, you know, what it, air quality, water quality, it's not awful in the industrial world. They hate industry so much. It's awful in the developing world. In the developing world, poor people are still having to burn cow dung and wood when they can find it in their homes to heat their homes and cook their food. And the women who are mainly, mainly doing this in huts are dying of respiratory diseases at an incredibly young age. Um, young kids are dying at an incredibly young age because of rural air pollution caused by the fact that they haven't got a reliable source of electricity, cheap electricity. You know, they die of diarrhea in the most horrendous numbers because there is no modern industrial um, uh, uh, water systems uh, that, can, uh, 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 that, that we enjoy in the West. They're always exploiting these situations in, in, in um, uh, uh, the, the, the Greens. The, the, how many times have you seen poor, unfortunate women up to here in Bangladesh wandering through water and they're saying, oh, sea level rises. No, it's not sea level rises. <coughs> Bangladesh, Bangladesh floods because it's a very low-lying country and they have huge monsoons and they have very poor water management. They have poor um, um, a, a protection, flood protection. That's what causes it. Um, as it happens, there have not been more floods in um, uh, uh, Bangladesh for the last 70 years. It is not um, sea level, but they will, you know, because they're diverting attention from the actual real problems that these people face, actually, they're consigning them to you know, even more misery by insisting that Africa's got a lot of coal, it's got a, you know an awful lot of oil. But no, 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 no. You've got to use these ridiculous um, uh, you know wind farms and solar energy that is going to just produce utterly expensive and unreliable forms of electricity for the poorest people in the world who can't even afford any electricity at the moment. The, 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 that's the real hypocrisy. These greens mm. are grinding the faces of poor people in the developing world into the dust and yet using that poverty to try and, you know, advertise their, their moral superiority. It's almost they want clients to, to, to sort of speak on behalf of, and that actually that when people become you can part read, of it... You can read it in their disgusting books. They will say, you know, from smallest beautiful Schumacher onwards, we cannot have the third world, as they used to call it, develop, you know, a, a, a make the same mistakes as the first world. We cannot have that because Gaia cannot cope. You know, what mm. bastards, what bastards. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to sort of worry about, um, I mean, it's right to worry about um, ga gas boilers being replaced with air source heat pumps, but there's some really hard on the ground um, realities that, 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 that we that can, can get missed. In that debate, and and they're very keen to. I mean, going back to Mark Linus's, uh, he wants to hold a tribunal to hold, or um, uh, well, he did. I think he may have changed his mind in the years since because he realised it was a nonsense. But he wanted to hold. He plenty of other people do. Well, I think one has even talked about death penalties for 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 notorious climate climate deniers. So to to hold climate well, I'm, deniers I'm, I'm for into account, sure. it's like. I, I'm, do you want yeah. to <laughs> oh well, um, but uh, better better that than live in their their utopia. But that but but that's the point. But but if we try to do a body count of what 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 the green movement had caused in 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 Africa and Asia, I wonder what that would be. And I wonder how many died of malaria because of their campaign against DDT, which was mm -hmm. very effective in in, in um, keeping down the the population of mosquitoes. I mean, mm -hmm. tens of millions, tens of millions have died because of that ridiculous nonsense. Um, that the Greens perpetrated there. 
but you know it's it's you cannot count the number of early deaths that might have been avoided if uh, the greens hadn't been waging a campaign for decade upon decade upon decade against industrialization in the so-called developing world. I don't know why they bother calling it the developing world anymore. They're dead set against it developing. Mm. Mm. They want to, want to keep it. We, we've got an, we've, 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 we've gone up to now. Have you got a few more minutes to go through stuff or have you got to skate off? Yeah. Okay. Um, why, why then, I mean, we're talking about some quite, quite stark realities and some quite, um, you know, ridiculous things that you know ridiculous uh ridiculous people doing blocking roads and and a, and, a, and a festival of hypocrisy and gloom and doom and nonsense why do you think it's been so hard um to persuade other people why haven't we had a can why hasn't canning town been writ larger as it were um do you think is it is it just that the reality of it is all just too weird or people dis disengaged to a sort of a, a, dis a moment of disengagement from politics or something else? I think it's really hard because they are so effective at controlling the public realm. You know, as we've talked about, they they control the BBC, they control uh, Channel 4 effectively, um, with a few odd, odd, odd exceptions. But, you know, they, they control, you know, they, 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 their control is so great. How does... The opposition bubble up. I mean, the worrying thing is, not very long ago, I made a film about uh, Joseph Goebbels and um, the way that the Nazis, because the Nazis were not, you know, terribly popular. They couldn't really win an election on their own. They did, you know, they, but, they, 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 but they, nevertheless, they secured this power. But by the time they controlled the newspapers, they controlled the radio, uh, you know, they controlled, uh, you know, the universities. Um, they, by the time they control all that, where does the voice come from that says, okay, guys, let's rally? And it's the same with other issues as well. Britain, I think, has been largely Eurosceptic for absolutely ages, but they've been, they were very careful for a very long time not to ask them, not to give them the vote, not to give them the option. And then, actually, the, the heroic Nigel Farage, actually, who, um, uh, uh, you know, the success of UK forced them to do that. But that surprised them enormously. I remember my family is up in uh, South Shields in Sunderland, um, and I remember going up there, and they'd been Labour, you know, for, for you know a ge generation, two generations, but they were voting UKIP. You know, if something emerges like that that allows something to express itself, and and also there needs to be a spark when things happen gradually. When things happen slowly, there's a road closure here. The price of petrol goes up here. There's a little bit of stuff. You know, the boilers might be big enough uh, uh, to do that, but what's the thing that really pushes people over the edge? Because at the moment, I think ordinary people just want to, oh, sh they can't be bothered. They won't watch it on the tel television. If Greta Thunberg comes on, they'll switch over. You know, if Caroline Lucas comes on, they'll smother their face with a pillow. But, you know, they won't actually take to the streets. It takes a lot, and it takes a specific set of circumstances, I think, to mobilise ordinary people in that way. Right, right, yeah. So finally then, um, you've made some extremely interesting films that we're, we're all very grateful for. Um, very and some of them, some of them haven't been on TV, and they're so increasingly not on. Well, not on not on terrestrial uh, TV. What do you think is the future for that kind of very high quality, intellectually grounded and research, very very deep research based uh, filmmaking? Um, the, you know, the 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 truly independent and 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 challenging filmmaking rather than you know stud, stunning and brave um film filmmaking will it will they ever let us on the monolith uh, back on the monoliths or or do we accept that the the monoliths are going to crumble and we're going to find our own new avenues i think we probably have to find our own new avenues i think one or two things might sneak through i'm going to pitch channel four again to see if i can do another uh, swindle type film but i'm um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not massively hopeful. <laughs> um, but I think that Brexit, the movie, was interesting for me because that was crowdfunded and lots and lots of people, I think more people saw that film than, than would have seen it if it had gone out on Channel 4. So mm -hmm. my thought is, and I mean, we've chatted about this sort of separately a little bit, but, it, you know, maybe the thing to do is crowdfund a film or a, a short series of films on uh, climate uh, next year when I'm, I'm free at the end of December. Um, and I think in the process of 
crowdfund what worked with Brexit the movie is in the process of crowdfunding, sort of everyone who put a fiver or 20 quid in to make the film felt actually that they became propagandists for the film. They became, you know, part mm. of the publicity machine. And so maybe if we can create enough fuss around um, a big film that has, you know, the the the, 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 the you know, a lot of the great, you know, scientists, John Christie, you know, uh, uh, Dick Lindzen, you know, Svensmark, Shaviv, a lot of those people in there um, uh, and others, but also goes into the politics like we've been doing today. And you in it, you've got to be in it. Um, but um, I, I think that I think that's probably the way to make it. And I think if we if we if we make it big enough um, and shout about enough, they won't be able to avoid. Uh, they won't be able to dodge it. And that 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 will uh, that will be much better yeah. than a custard pie. Brilliant. <laughs> yes. Right. Well, thanks very much for joining me uh, today, uh, Martin. It's been great. Thank I could do it. I well could talk for another but, two or three hours. But um, it's been a tough week for you. I'm sorry I lost your voice here, but really well done doing this. It's a fantastic so way to um, poke cop in the eye. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I hope I hope, I hope everyone's enjoying it. Um, so stay on the line, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna say goodbye to everyone. Um, Thank you again, of course, uh, for watching and thanks for uh, all the support I've had for this project. Uh, tomorrow is a slight change of time. I'm, uh, we're going to be with uh, Rupert Darwell from One O'Clock. We're going to be talking about economics, uh, uh, climate economics and the UNFCC, uh, the history of the UNFCCC uh, as we... Uh, that will include a discussion about Rishi Sunak's uh, rewiring of the economy that we uh, mentioned earlier. On Saturday, we have uh, Professor James Woodhausen, who you may have seen giving uh, uh, John Gummer, uh, or certainly his reputation, a grilling on GB News this week. Um, I, I may be taking a break on Sunday, but uh, thanks once again and uh, see you all tomorrow.